Hey everyone, Sam here. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. In this video, I'm going to show you how to paint this landscape that features some misty mountains inspired by the Fiordland region in southern New Zealand. This is an area I've been to many times and I've done many paintings of this under different lighting conditions and different times of the year. And this is a bit different to my paintings I normally do in that the scene is overcast, very cloudy and wet. So in this type of painting, we need to make sure our values are correct so that we get the atmospheric depth that we need and also to keep the painting looking interesting. But if you're new to landscape painting especially, it's a really good exercise in helping you understand values in the landscape, which is how light or dark a subject is. So I'm going to be talking about that in the video as I demonstrate how to paint this artwork. Now, just before I start the video, I'd like to quickly tell you about my Patreon channel. Each month I upload a full length painting tutorial video where I show you how to paint an artwork from start to finish. Also provide lesson notes and reference photos. I also upload time-lapse videos and other bonus content as well, all for just $5 a month. And I've put a link in the description box below. So let's get into the video. I hope you enjoy it. This was the reference photo that I used to create this painting. It's Mount Talbot and Mount Crosscut in southern New Zealand. And I love this mountain range. It's probably my favourite mountain view to paint in New Zealand. Naturally forms a good composition. And I've done many paintings of this mountain view, especially under different weather and lighting conditions. And I felt really inspired to paint this scene. Now prior to starting my artwork I did a sketch and this time I used gouache to create my sketch to refer to. I really like using gouache, I'm new to using it but I just like the colours and the painterly effects that you can get with it. They almost look like oil paintings. I'm painting on an 8 inch by 10 inch linen panel and this is a medium weave oil primed linen that's mounted to Baltic birch and made by a company called Sourcetech in the USA at canvaspanels.com. I love painting on this surface, they're also great for plain air painting as well. I'm using oil paints to paint this artwork but you could just as easily paint something like this in acrylics. And I'm sketching out the composition using Burnt Sienna mixed with Liquin Original. And Liquin's the medium I'm going to be mixing in with the paint and it speeds up the drying time and also improves the flow of the paint so it's really useful if you've got loads of paintings that you want to get on with. The colours I'm using in this painting includes Titanium White, Burnt Sienna, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Yellow, Cadmium Red Light, Alizarin Crimson, Ultramarine Blue and Thalo Green. I'm using a brand of paint called Blue Ridge Oils and they're based in North Carolina in the USA and this is an artist quality oil, absolutely beautiful to paint with. Even if you've never painted with oils in your life, I'd always recommend using an artist quality oil because your painting results will look much, much better. And actually some of those paints will go a lot further, even some of those more expensive colors, which although they are quite expensive, some of them, they do actually tend to last quite a long time. Now, whenever I start a painting, the first thing I think about is where are all the dark values and shadows in the landscape that I'm painting? As I always paint these first, value is how light or dark a subject is and I found that by painting in your dark values first it makes it much easier to paint in all the other areas afterwards that are in the light. This is something I've learnt through plain air painting. Now in a scene like this it's really important that we get our values correct because this type of landscape it's wet, it's misty and it's overcast so in order to make this painting interesting we want to communicate that kind of misty atmosphere which means we've really got to get the values correct so that the mountains are receding into those distant misty clouds. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm painting the cloud cover that's draping these mountains and I'm using a mix of ultramarine blue with some burnt sienna, a little alizarin crimson and quite a bit of titanium white. So this is a kind of light grey colour and I'm applying the paint here with a number 5 flat brush. Now I mostly use flat brushes, filberts and dagger brushes for painting landscapes, especially flat brushes because I like those broad painterly marks. 
I'm using Rosemary & Co brushes and if you'd like to get some of those I've put a link in the description below. So I've just roughly marked in the clouds the next thing I'm painting is this distant mountain here where we can only see the base of it because it's covered in cloud. And I'm using the same colours that I've used in the clouds but with less titanium white. I've also topped it up with a little bit more ultramarine blue as well so that's going to be that distant mountain. And the darks here, these dark shadows, are not dark at all actually, they're going to be quite light. So as I'm moving forward, now painting in Mount Crosscut here, just outlining some of the side of the mountain. This is mostly under this gloomy kind of shadow. There's cloud everywhere, no sunlight on it. And quite a lot of those rocks that are exposed on the mountain slopes are reasonably dark in value. But the mountains in the mid-ground, we want to communicate the mistiness of it. So the value is still relatively light. It's kind of a mid-tone. And again, I've used the same colours that I've used in the clouds and that background mountain, but with less titanium white. Now, in terms of the value scale, it's represented with white at one end and black at the other, and then there's a load of greys and mid-tones. And we'll find our darkest darks and our lightest lights in the foreground. But as we go into the distance, darks are not as dark and lights are not as light, and that's because the value scale narrows. So we need to keep this in mind when we're painting a landscape such as this. You'll see in this mid-ground mountain that the darkest darks are not especially dark, they're kind of a mid-tone. If I was to use a really dark colour here, it would bring it forward in the landscape and we'd lose that atmospheric depth. Now as I'm working forward, my darks are getting darker and as I said, we'll find our darkest darks in the foreground which are in these bushes here that I'm painting and this is a mix of ultramarine blue with a little yellow ochre and that's going to create a very dark green so these shadows have a green cast to them. Again I'm using a number 5 flat brush to mark in these shadows. So what I'm doing is I'm quickly building up a tonal dynamic in the painting which is just going to make it much easier to add the areas that are in light and just get the saturation of those colours correct as well but I'll talk about that in just a moment. Now these tree shadows that I'm painting here, I'm using the same colours as these shadows and the plants in the foreground, but I've just added a tiny amount of titanium white in there just to make the value a little bit lighter. Trees are some of the darkest values to be found in the landscape, especially in a forest setting as well, because there's often lots of occlusion shadows where there's just no light passing through at all. Plus many trees have quite dark coloured foliage as well. So now that I've established all my main areas of shadows within the painting, I start working back and coming forward in the painting, adding some colour. And here I'm painting the distant grass that's on the mid-ground mountain. Now grass is some of the more lighter values to be found in the landscape. And it's also important as well that where I'm painting it in the mid-ground here, that the colour of the green is not too saturated, otherwise it's going to come forward in the painting. So I've mixed up a pale green here, starting with some yellow ochre, some ultramarine blue, a lot of titanium white, and I've also introduced a little bit of phthalo green and some alizarin crimson as well. That's just going to increase the saturation, but it is kind of a cold looking grass green. So as I said, it's light in value and it's quite pale as well. Now as I work forward in the painting, I'm going to be increasing the saturation or chroma of the green, so turning up the volume of the colour and I'll be using my most saturated colours in the foreground. This is where I can use much richer grass greens, which I'll be mixing in just a moment. For now, I'm just painting in the side of the mountain, adding in some of these grassy areas and vegetation that's growing on the mountain slope. I'm applying the paint here with a number three flat brush. Now as I work my way towards the foreground I'm increasing the saturation of these greens I'm using and I'm mixing a variety of greens. There's some olive tones in there, some emerald greens and basically what I've done is I've started off with a basic green mix and I've just varied up the mixture by mixing in different amounts of colours. So I start off with some yellow ochre, some ultramarine blue, some cadmium yellow and then I've also mixed in some alizarin crimson or even in some places some cadmium red which I've used instead of alizarin crimson. 
Then I've also, where I've needed to, adjust the value with some titanium white and for those more emerald tones I've mixed in some phthalo green. So I've used variations of these mixtures. Now when I'm painting an artwork I always think about the colour harmony. So that's making the colours look harmonious and pleasing to the eye. And the way we can do this is through using common colours throughout the painting. So this is something else that I try and do. Now just going back to the grass here, this is more of a grass green, emerald green maybe. And for this I used yellow ochre with cadmium yellow, ultramarine blue, some titanium white, a little phthalo green, and the colours rounded off with a small amount of cadmium red. Now the cadmium red just helps to calm down the green. So the problem with greens is they can look a little bit too neon or artificial if you're not careful. So mixing in a colour that contains red or a red will help to harmonise that green and just make it look more natural. So in this case I've used either cadmium red or some alizarin crimson. You could even use burnt sienna as well. So in the immediate foreground where I'm painting the grass this is where I'm going to be using my most saturated greens. And we're going to find our most saturated colours in the foreground. As we go into the distance the green will not be as intense as green wavelengths tend to drop out over long distances so they'll become quite quickly desaturated. Now here I'm painting in some bushes as well using a more kind of rich cold neon green here. Again I've used the same colours but I've just added a little bit more ultramarine blue and phthalo green in the mix. Now phthalo green is an awesome kicker as in it kicks up the saturation of an existing green that you've made so it's a real good colour to have in your collection of colours but you'll only need a small amount of this colour, it's very strong. Here I'm painting some straw coloured grass that's in the foreground and midground here. This is just going to add interest to the vegetation in the foreground and I've used a mix of yellow ochre with some alizarin crimson, titanium white and a little ultramarine blue. And I've also allowed some of my grass green mix to mix in with it as well. I start adding some darker layers of colour here with some more olive tones and these are going to be some of these bushes that are in the foreground. I've generally, as I said, used a variation of the green mixes that I made earlier on. So to communicate things such as bushes where I'll add more ultramarine blue and yellow ochre into the mix. And then for those more grass green areas, I've used more cadmium yellow and phthalo green, also titanium white to adjust the value. So I'm getting all my basic colours down and then what I'll do after is I'm going to restate the darks and really emphasise some more of the shadows in the bushes in the foreground. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm using a number 5 flat brush and just applying some shadows across the foreground and it's the same mix I used a moment ago which was ultramarine blue and some yellow ochre. So that's also going to have a green cast to it but because I've used these two colours in my green mixes as well it will blend in nicely and it will look harmonious. The blocking in stage is nearly complete and I'm just adding in some snow on the top of the mountain here. And this is mostly titanium white with a small amount of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna and alizarin crimson mixed in. The same colours that I've used in the clouds and the mountain slopes. Again, keeping the colour harmony. I'm applying the paint with a number three flat brush and I'm just marking in some areas of snow. I finish up the blocking in stage by just adding a few more details and getting as much information down as I can. And then what I'm going to need to do is allow it to dry so that afterwards I can add more details to it. Now, during the blocking in stage and when you're completing it, the main thing you want to make sure is, are your colours and values working and is the whole thing working in general? The other thing is, is I keep my values generally darker when I start the painting and then I'll add lighter layers throughout and then at the very end of the painting that's where I'll be adding my lightest values. So it was here that I allowed the painting to dry for a few days. At this point the painting was dry and I had one more painting sesh on it just to add a few more details to it and really just create the atmosphere of a wet misty mountain landscape. So I added a few darker layers to the cloud here that's in the midground and background and again I'm using the same colours I used in the block-in stage and this is ultramarine blue with some burnt sienna, 
titanium white and a little alizarin crimson. So I'm just painting a few darker areas of cloud. I really want to emphasize some of these lighter areas of mist that are shrouding the mountain in the midground. Also using a number five flat brush and these brushes are just great for painting clouds, especially real big, thick, chunky clouds, misty clouds like this one or cumulus clouds that you'd find in a landscape, especially on a hot summer's day, that kind of stuff. Just awesome brushes for clouds. Now I was just adding more layers as well just to make sure that the white of the canvas underneath is completely covered so just restating some of these darker values. This background mountain here where you can see it there and it's just the same colours that I used before, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson and titanium white with less titanium white in it to make the value darker. I'm also blending these colours in with the clouds as well just so that it's got a nice smooth transition line there, making those clouds look misty. Next, I was working on the mid-ground mountain here and I felt that it needed some darker, deeper areas of shadows. So I mostly painted this in some of these deep cracks and fissures within the side of the mountain. Again, the same colors that I used before, but just with less titanium white in the mix. That is going to bring the mountain slightly forward, but not too much. I really haven't gone overboard with the detail either. In fact, I've just been painting the suggestion of detail, which actually makes it look more detailed. The human brain fills in the rest of the information. I'll be saving most of all the detail for the foreground. With regards to colour mixes, I'm pretty much using the same colours that I used during the blocking stage, but just in many cases applying lighter layers, so the values of these colours will be a little bit lighter than I used to start with. So just adding more details to these bushes and shrubs that are here in the foreground and midground, then I'm also going to be working on the grass, but also painting some of these bright green trees as well. Those emerald tones are really going to look good in this landscape. Now here I'm adding a bit of colour to these trees and making the value a little bit lighter than these dark values that I've painted in during the blocking stage. There is quite a subtle difference between the values in these trees here and I don't want them to be too light in value. As I said before, trees are some of the darkest values to be found in the landscape and this whole scene is quite dark in general apart from the misty cloud in the background. The colours I've mixed for these trees is mostly yellow ochre, ultramarine blue with a little cadmium yellow, a small amount of titanium white and rounded off with some alizarin crimson. I'm now restating and adding to these shadows for the bushes here and shrubs. And this time I'm applying the paint with a quarter inch dagger brush just because you can get some different marks here. As you can see here, I'm using the broad end of the brush, but then also you can use the tip of the brush as well for some finer details. So that gets some quite interesting marks. Also great for painting forests such as here, communicating dense stands of trees together as well. This is another versatile brush that you can use in landscape painting. There's actually two types of these brushes I've used. I've used these Tisch dagger brushes. These are bristle brushes. They're great for painting foliage and also the synthetic ivory dagger, which I haven't used that in this painting, but that's also another dagger brush that I used. This is great for painting things like rocks or just where you want some really sharp, fine marks. Again, these are made by Rosemary & Co brushes. Here I'm painting some of these emerald green trees and I just really love this green and I think it looks awesome in this type of landscape. So the same greens that I mixed before but has a lot more cadmium yellow and phthalo green in the mix. Also quite a bit of ultramarine blue as well. And these Tisch bristle dagger brushes are just great for the job here. I use this same colour to paint some deeper tones within the grass. And then the next thing I do is I start adding a few subtle highlights to some of these trees. And all I did was make the value lighter by mixing in some titanium white into my existing green mix. And with this dagger brush, just painting the suggestion of leaves and highlights on the tops of these tree canopies. I'm also adding this green mix to some of the other shrubs and bushes in the foreground. 
and that stand of trees in the midground. When it comes to painting things like the thick grass in the foreground, I often just let the brush and the bristles do the work. I don't go mad with the detail. Just painting the suggestion of detail actually goes a long way to creating convincing looking grass. Now the painting here at this point was nearly finished and I added some more details to the snow in the upper part of the mountain here using the same colours that I used during the block-in stage but making the value of the colour a little bit lighter so there's more titanium white in the mix. I finish up the painting by just adding a few lighter layers to the clouds mainly just mixing in some titanium white and some burnt sienna. Now this is the first time I've painted this kind of misty scene and you can see where getting your values right has really helped towards creating this type of landscape where we can see those receding landforms. So actually this type of scene could be really good for getting your head around understanding values in the landscape and how we can create atmospheric depth. I have to say I really enjoyed painting this artwork, I may even do a bigger painting of this but we'll see. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did be sure to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Also, please leave me a comment as well, I read all my comments and I do my best to respond to all of them. Now if you'd like to learn more about painting landscapes then check out the painting resources I have on my website. I've got a painting blog full of written painting tutorials that you can copy and use the reference photos that I provide. I also have full length painting tutorial videos available for sale from my website. And you can get instant access to all of these videos and more by subscribing to my Patreon channel for just $5 a month. And each month I'm uploading a full length painting tutorial video where I'll show you how to paint an artwork from start to finish, including how to mix all the colours which I demonstrate on my palette. I also provide reference photos, lesson notes, I upload time-lapse painting videos and other content as well, all for just $5 a month. And this is turning into a landscape painting course because you've got access to all the two years worth of painting tutorial videos that I have on there. So check that out. I've put the link in the description box below. Now I'm also giving away a free ebook called Introduction to Oil Painting, which you can get by subscribing to my email list. And I've put the link in the description box below. And lastly, I have some NFTs for sale available from crypto.com forward slash NFT. And again, I've put the link in the description box below. So thanks for watching. I hope this inspires you to paint some misty mountain landscapes. I hope you're having a beautiful day and I shall see you in the next video.